It has been such a joy to not only worship you with you before we were asked to help out, but um, also to be here and walk among you um, and be and feel the presence of Jesus Christ here. This is a blessed church, and I think it's important for me to just let you know that. The times, the signs of the times, turbulent times, social, our society turning from one God to multiple gods, immorality rampant, moral corruption, political instability, judicial injustice. Did you really want me to preach to you this morning? Divisions and factions abound. Trust issues. And this is just the introduction to Israel in the time of Jeremiah in our text, or um, the church of Corinth, um, where it's often said living like Corinthians was uh, the mode was the lingo then. I, I loved your article, Carolyn, um, a couple weeks ago when you described the Corinthian church as a cross between Los Angeles and Las Vegas, and that's very, very apt. But as I read that, did you think I was speaking about the United States, the world today? And if you did, that makes sense. Because the role of a prophet, Jeremiah, the role of an apostle, Paul, and the role of a faithful Christian today is to be challenged by the culture that we live in. So how are we functioning in a highly secular, highly diverse environment? How do we serve with delight? How do we cultivate a heart that desires God alone? That is the question we're going to be teasing out this morning. So listen now to Jeremiah's pre-exilic warning to the Israelites in Jerusalem. And that comes from Jeremiah, the ninth chapter, verses 23 through 24. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness and justice and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord." And now Paul's words, pulled from the third week of our Right Now a media series on 1 Corinthians. It's Paul's letter written to a church that he planted in Corinth. And this letter was for Jews and Gentiles alike, for everybody. So listen now to the word of the Lord from 1 Corinthians Chapter, nine, chapter 4, excuse me, 9 through, well, I believe 13. Listen now. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession. Like men condemned to die in the arena, we have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to men. We are fools for Christ. But you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, we are dishonored. To this very hour we go hungry and thirsty, we are in rags, we are brutally treated, we are homeless. We work hard with our hands, when we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. And up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. Yikes. 
My husband and I are transitional pastors and have been transitional pastors for a few years. And every time we go to a church, we seem to hear the same question, don't we, honey? And that is this. What are we doing wrong? <laughs> Why is our church shrinking? The church of Jesus Christ is in a tough place in our time. On one hand, we accept what the previous chapter, chapter 3, told us, that we have all that we want already as Christians. All is ours because we are in Christ and Christ is in God. So we live into that, but we ask ourselves, why does the church look like it does? Why doesn't it look like it did 10 years, 20 years, 30 years ago? Where there was money in the banks, the seats were filled, there are lots, in my, my experience, lots of youth tours, lots of mission trips, lots of things going on. My home church was the church that you belonged to if you were going to make it in business in Erie, Pennsylvania. So why then, or maybe why not, <laughs> why aren't we tempted to look back with such nostalgia? Instead of looking forward to the hope that God is doing something now. Why are we tempted to think that if we just change one or two things, get the right programs, that everything will be like it used to be? I think this text is asking us what should define success in the church. And along with my transitional ministry for the last five years, I've had the privilege of walking with churches through a, a, what I call a visioning process uh, or discerning God's preferred plan for the church. And on the first visit with every church that I've worked with, I always go through a rethinking process. Where are we in the church called to focus? And we use the terminology of the lower room or the upper room. The lower room is inhabited by what we call the four Ps. People, personalities, places, and programs. And this is the place where Jeremiah and Paul found the people of God in their texts. And it's where most churches reside, if we're really honest. And in these rooms, decisions are based on what people think, what personalities run the church, the city or the place, the culture that the church resides in, and finally, what programs we are wedded to. You know what I'm talking about. Programs that we, they don't ever seem to change and we may, if we're really honest, wonder why we're still doing them. The upper room, though, is very different. In the upper room, the sole focus is discerning God's call for the church. And nothing in the upper room gets in the way. Not people, not personalities, not places or programs. Because everything depends on the call that Jesus Christ is giving the church. And clearly in our text, Paul is challenging the church of Corinth and us, I think, to see ourselves first and foremost as disciples of Jesus Christ, employing his vision for his church. And in verse 9, Paul is asking, are Christians willing to display, to be put on display, to be ridiculed, to face hardships for the gospel? Are we living in Christ's upper room or are we living in the world's lower room with all of its expectations, and they change all the time, don't they? And he uses a very interesting illustration, in verse 9 especially. And as Pittsburghers, I think we probably get this more than most cities in the United States, because we're a city of champions, aren't we? And we are used to victory parades or processions, aren't we? You know what I'm talking about. When the Steelers or the Pirates or the Penguins win their, the whole shooting match, there's a big procession and everybody comes and everybody claps. 
But this victory parade, this procession is different because in Rome, it was a military procession or parade. And at the very end, it wasn't just members of the team. At the very end of that procession was always the slaves, the people that had been conquered. And they were in that procession because they were going to be led to the Colosseum. They were to become lunch for the animals there or gladiators. But either way, the spectacle was driving them toward certain death. You could say they were dead men walking. So you see, Paul understands that it's too easy for the church to see our life and our ministry through the culture's place and power and wealth to desire the church to be like the world, but not the Savior who founded it, bought her with his blood. Too easy to forget our purpose is to live in Christ's humility and sacrifice, even hardship. I love it when we baptize a baby because we always place on that child the baptismal vows. We are part of a victory procession when we say that we are baptized into Christ's death, that we might be raised in Christ's resurrection. So this is a very different kind of procession because Christ has won the victory in our lives. He is the victor. And yes, because of that, we are captivated by grace. And we are led to our death, not an eternal death, but an eternal life, but, but very clearly to lay down our lives, our culture, our perceptions, our whole to be spent for the victor, for, for our Savior, for Jesus. And as a result, our whole attitude is not to be of this world. I know you've heard this before, but really, it's gotta be deeper. It's gotta be clearer. Our vision becomes Christ's vision. And because it's Christ, it's the Father's vision. It's his kingdom vision for the world. Case in point, Many churches, when they think of success, they think of what we call the ABCs. And the ABCs are attendance, preferably very, very large. It's good for the congregation. It's good for the pastor. Fill this place up. B, buildings. We want beautiful buildings, and you certainly have a beautiful building here, well kept. And C, cash, ABCs, offering enough at very least, enough to fund the programs that we enjoy. And, and for many churches, that becomes the baseline for success, the ABCs. But interestingly enough, Paul is giving us very different um, acronyms for success, hard acronyms for success. F, foolishness. W, weakness. D, dishonor. He caps it off with a title called, You Will Be Fools for Christ. And honestly, these are not the attributes that most of us want to see or live through. But we are called to follow where the victor, where our Savior leads us. We are to exhibit his difference in the world. So who is the victor in your parade? Is it Christ who serves even to death, the death of our desires and our dreams, to take on his desires and his purpose for us, to be seen as foolish and fools in the world? Because, dear ones, when we live out Christ, the world scratches its head. <laughs> or we 
challenged to live in the church for ourselves, blind to our true spiritual condition and thinking that we're in charge, that we're fine. Giving our lives to the church a little bit, but don't get carried away. That would be foolish. What is the point that I'm trying to make? We humans are worshiping beings. The question is, what are we worshiping? John Calvin says this, the human heart is an idol factory. And when we forget that, we unwittingly reduce God's ways to our ways and God's thoughts to our thoughts. Our hearts become factories of idols in which we fashion and refashion God to fit our needs and desires. And Jeremiah understood this perfectly, didn't he? Because Jeremiah said, wise men don't boast in your vision, in your wisdom. I add, because there's always somebody wiser, isn't there? And mighty men, they won't boast in their might. Because as I'm learning, strength fades as you get older. Rich men can't boast in their riches. And I add, you can't take it with you, can you? If we are going to boast, we boast in this, that we understand and know God. That the Lord alone practices this kind of steadfast love. That the Lord alone practices justice. That the Lord alone is wholly righteous. And for these things, <laughs> God delights to see them in us. Isn't that beautiful? God delights to see them in us. Jeremiah saw that Judah was focusing on human wisdom and power. Paul recognized that the Corinthian church was making the same mistake. The Corinthians loved to, to philosophize and to talk about wisdom. Paul saw that they were now being formed into Corinthian society rather than into Christ. And we have to ask ourselves, are we any different? That service fair went on a couple weeks ago. I was in Wisconsin and couldn't be a part of it. And um, I'm sure that any of you that went to the service fair had a hard time signing up because all of the slots were filled. No? Why weren't all the slots filled? Why were some left empty? If we are slaves and servants to Jesus Christ, why are there any slots open in this church? Now, did that annoy you? Did I offend you? Well, that's not my goal because believe me, on a regular basis, there are things that I say, Lord, I don't want to do that. And on a weekly basis, I wonder sometimes if judgment won't be not what I did wrong, but the opportunities I missed and the people that didn't hear about Jesus Christ because of that. My point is not to judge, it's to ask, what do I do with God's word when it contradicts the culture that I live in, the lifestyle that I've adopted? Do I choose God's call or do I choose the culture? And how do I justify the choice if I am a slave to Christ, if I have been bought with a price, if he is the victor and I am the captor by grace? Today, I hope that you start to see this text and the discomfort that it raises as a great gift. A wake-up call that asks, who have I really given my life to? Because like the Corinthian church, Paul is still asking us to mark the decline in the church, in our faith and in our lives, so that we can recommit, that we can follow him 
that we can be sold out for Christ. Slaves conquered by grace, fools for Christ, eternally blessed. Scum of the earth, you see where I'm going with this. Because the, al the alternative is the greatest delusion and it's to call ourselves the church of Jesus Christ and yet not look like him. There was a recent poll of nuns, you know what I mean by nuns, people that have no affiliation to religion at all. And in that poll, 74% said that the most condemning thing about the church was that it didn't look like Jesus Christ. Is Mount Lebanon Evangelical Presbyterian Church going through hardship? Are you personally challenged and feel like life is hard right now? Have your beliefs in Jesus Christ been labeled by our culture as foolish? Have you felt like the church is weak? Have you felt dishonored by the culture? It's okay to admit the struggle. In fact, congratulations, because when you find yourself there, you find yourself in the presence of Jesus Christ, the living one. And in that moment, you find yourself holding on and focusing and saying, Lord, I'll go with you wherever you call me to go. And in that moment, you take on the strength of the one who created all things. Tim Keller has a wonderful illustration that I just love. He said that this has changed his entire life. He was a pastor. He's passed away now. Oh, I miss him. But he was a pastor in New York City. And he said when he was in, I think, college, he heard this illustration. If the distance between the earth and the sun is 93 million miles and was no thicker than the thickness of a sheet of paper, then the distance from Earth to the nearest star would be a stack of papers 70 feet high. Perhaps higher than the ceiling, I'm not sure, but pretty close. The diameter of the Milky Way would be a stack of papers over 300 miles high. Now keep in mind that there are more galaxies in the universe than we can number. There are more, it seems, than the dust specks in the air or grains of sand on the seashore. So if Jesus Christ holds all of God's creation together with just a word, <laughs> would you not agree with me? That is power. And power like the world can't produce. Could Babylon produce that power in Jeremiah's day? Could Rome and Paul's? How about America today? Do we have that kind of power? <laughs> to claim that that master is the master of the human soul, can we say to Christ, Is he the kind of person that we can actually say, you can be my assistant in life? <laughs> no. He is Lord. He is Lord alone. He is the only one to be trusted in hardship. He is the only one in suffering that we know he knows exactly what we feel. And he shows us in Jesus how to cultivate our truest delight, how to live for Christ. 1 Corinthians 4, 12b through 13 says, When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. Or as Philippians 2 says, if we have any encouragement, we need to be united in Christ. If any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the Spirit, tenderness and compassion, then make our joy complete by being like-minded and having the same love, 
the same spirit, the same mind, doing nothing out of selfishness, ambition or vain conceit. Oh, Lord Jesus, rather in humility, value others more than ourselves having the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And you start to see how this kind of activity changes the world because when Jesus was on the cross, when he was persecuted, he didn't didn't slander, did he? He forgave. And because of that, that Roman soldier said, surely he was the son of God. When persecuted in a Roman prison, Paul endured with the mindset of Jesus Christ. And what happened? The Roman guard, the most prestigious of all the guards in the Roman Empire, had to be changed out regularly because they all started to come to Jesus. Because they saw in Paul the very mindset, the very person of Jesus Christ. In World War II, one of my heroes in the faith, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, was reviled as a traitor by the Third Reich. He was imprisoned with SS guards, and you know how bad they were. (laughs) But they too started to come to Christ on a regular basis. They had to be changed out. They had to lose their place in the SS because they found something greater. They found Jesus Christ. They found the true conqueror who brought death to our ways, but a life eternal. I want to close with this. Here is the reality. The world today doesn't need more churches. The world today doesn't need more churches. It needs servants inhabiting those churches that will cultivate a heart that God desires. Understanding they know the Father. Experiencing, practicing steadfast love, they live out justice. They desire to serve the Lord alone, to be wholly righteous on earth. When reviled, they bless. When persecuted, they endure. When slandered, they entreat. They become Christ in the world. The mindset of Christ alone is theirs. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, as we come to you today, I don't know how this sermon has landed, but for me, it is inspiring me to live more for you. It is inspiring me to think, Lord Jesus, how can it be that you loved me like that? It is inspiring me even as a Presbyterian who doesn't really feel comfortable sharing her faith out in the world to tell the truth of who our Heavenly Father is, his everlasting love, and Jesus Christ, servant, slave even, to God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord Jesus, I want to be like that. And I know that this church is filled with people like that. And Lord, when we come to that kind of understanding, that mindset of Christ, I pray that you will give us eyes to see our weakness, but the strength of the Holy Spirit. And to connect and to walk with those around us who also feel weak. So that when they ask, how is it that you have the strength to go on, we can say, it's Jesus. And Lord, when people persecute us, give us the ability to see past that kind of viciousness. To see with the eyes of Jesus to view our Heavenly Father and to know that His strength is sufficient so that we can enter this world as salt and light, as yeast, that the world will know. 
Be with our politicians, Lord, as they entered. Be with our Christian politicians, Lord, that they may be sold in light, that they may not be sold out to the rivalries and to all the things that are going on in our government today, but that they may have the eyes of Christ to see. Be with those, Lord, who are dealing with illnesses. We're so thankful that Cindy is coming back healed and whole. But we pray for other people in our congregation, Lord, who are dealing with illnesses or pain that will not abate. May they be given by your Holy Spirit the mindset of Christ to rest into that infirmity, knowing that Jesus knows exactly what they're feeling and he's with them. He won't heal, he won't leave them and he will heal them, we pray in his purpose and his time. Lord Jesus, be in this church. Give us eyes, upper room eyes that will not settle for anything that this culture is trying to feed us. Give us a desire to do more than is proper, <laughs> more than it is expected because we have eyes to see the depths of your grace and all that you've done for us. Lord, make us servants, make us even slaves to Christ. And we all pray this, Lord, for your will to be done, your kingdom to come on earth as it in heaven. And so together, Lord, not my words, not our words, but Christ's words together in the prayer that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Will you stand as you are feel able and share with me the words of the Apostles' Creed, words that have been said for thousands of years, and we pray for thousands of years yet to come. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. Third day, he rose again from the dead and sits on the right hand, and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.